Welcome to the final session. Uh, just a couple of points. One is where I've been asked to direct you to the IAEE website to complete uh, one of the um, questionnaires regarding your thoughts on how successful or otherwise this conference was. Uh, in case you're wondering, we ended up with 412 registrations, which I thought was uh, more than more than. So we, um, we've got the concluding session and um, essentially this is really asking our four guest speakers to uh, imagine how the energy market from various perspectives uh, will look over forthcoming years or, and decades. So um, basically I just uh, asked the for speakers to use their imagination and if they wished uh, to be uh, provocative. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I think we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for each speaker without questions afterwards. And then following that audience participation, it would be nice, uh, by all means ask questions if you wish, but afterwards, but um, it would be nice if you could take some of the themes briefly uh, uh, and expand upon your own thoughts uh, along the lines of energy market futures. But we, we'll get started with the four speakers and then hopefully you'll get some ideas that you can add in. We do have to finish fairly promptly at half past five because it's six o'clock. Uh, there's the state of origin rugby match from Australia between New South Wales and Queensland. Um, <laughs> So that really dictates the timing. So we've, I'll introduce our four speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be Bo Tiang Lin, who is a professor from Simon University, followed by Reinhard Haas, who is uh, from Vienna University of Technology, and Peter Hartley from Rice University, and finally Ricardo Rainier, professor at uh, Pontifica Catholic University of Chile. So we'll start with you, BQ. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. The first, I want to thank you for all of you that stayed until the last moment. I only expect about 20, so it looks like more than 20. Uh, I was uh, asked by Tony to provide a, uh, to provide a outlook or forecast on what China's energy demand or any structure looks like. And I almost replied to him, I said, well, that's something that's not possible. Well, let me tell you why, why it's not possible. Uh-oh, uh -oh. what's going on? <laughs> well, that's really not possible, huh? Uh-oh, uh -oh. that's also not good. What's this one? No, I know you see this please. one. Yeah. Okay, that's not possible. Look at that. That China's GDP, energy, uh, primary energy, that's blue one, and also electricity green one. And uh, that's how it looks on the, on the demand growth rate every year. And uh, that's not possible to forecast, right? How do you do that? So the, 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 at least from this, uh, uh, for example, in 2010, 2011, our electricity demand is roughly uh, 12 to 13%. And um, if we go down to 2015, it's 1% of close to the zero. And also, there's one uh, huge dynamic jump up and down. It's impossible to forecast. Second is that uh, there's a huge gap sometimes between GDP and, and energy and electricity demand. So many foreigners began to question how could it be possible? Normally, that certain parts of GDP uh, with a certain parts of energy demand, you cannot produce a GDP without consume energy. So therefore, have to be certain. What is not certain there? Okay, it's not certain proportion there. It's a jump up and down, you know, uh, all the time. So the 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 given that the, I'm not pretending I can forecast, but I will try to understand why it's uh, such a fluctuation and why there's a big gap possible to have big gap between GDP and energy demand, electricity demand. <clears throat> and this is uh, CO2 growth. I, we'll, we'll come back to this later. <clears throat> I think the main reason why there's a huge jump back and forth between the energy demand and 
primary energy demand and electricity demand. And also sometimes produce a gap between GDP and electricity and energy is because of the China's energy and electricity consumption are heavily concentrated in the heavy industry. Five or six steel cement consume roughly 63% of, uh, of energy in 2015. This is 2015, I believe. Uh, 2014, because the 2015, 2016 numbers somehow mix up. So, uh, and contribute very little to the GDP, only about 26% of GDP. Now, the rationale here is that the heavy industry is very sensitive to economy uh, up or down. Okay, so economy began to see the signs of economy going down. The heavy industry respond to it very quickly. Other industry responds a, a, a little bit more slowly. So the, now it, it come to the, the, the it come to the conclusion that the, when economy is slowing down and heavy industry respond to it very quickly, and then that when heavy industry slow down, then it has a huge impact on electricity and energy demand. So the energy demand grows very big, come down very quickly. But GDP still maintains somehow there. It's because they still can sell inventories. In other words, I'm not producing, but I'm selling my inventories. And that's why that when the economy changing around, uh, if you look at this one, if you look at this one, when economy situation become better, then it, it come back right away. And it's, it's growth rate is much higher than GDP. There's a period of uh, to, to, to make up the inventory. So the, the, the inventory itself, because it's so much concentrated, the inventory that many other factors, of course, contribute to the gap. But inventory, I think, is a major uh, factor, such that you'll be able to see the large fluctuation and also gap between the GDP and energy. I'm not defending the number is correct. That's not my purpose. I'm just saying that's possible. Given the so much concentration on the heavy industry, it's totally possible that for you to see the large fluctuations and also gap between the GDP and energy. Right? The conclusion is that, yes, it's possible. The second conclusion is that uh, huge impact on international market. That's why so many people are so interested in the China's energy demand and also other demand of major commodities. Not because China's big, also because of dynamic. You fracture so much, how are we going to prepare for your market, for your expansion? You come up with 11%. Yes, we do 11% investment and you know, do it accordingly. But it turns out it's 1%. So the whole international market is a chaos because of China jump up and down and in different periods of time and very frequently, actually. So that's the China's impact uh, on the commodity market future, on the energy market is enormous, not because of size. We're largest any system, electricity system, but not because of size. Size is important, also because of dynamic. So everybody watch China's energy demand and GDP growth, and also other signs of economy very closely. It's precisely because of there's so much dynamic there. Another conclusion is that if looking at here, many people criticize that. How come China with a power surplus of 20 to 35 percent right now, and we still come up with 50 to 40, 60 gigawatt, 40 gigawatt, I think about someone about 40 gigawatt co-fire coming out this year. The people begin to criticize, given such a surplus, how can you still building it? No, that's not we are building it now. The, de the decision was, uh, was made in 2010, 2011, normally take a few years to prepare and a few years to construct. So let's say that if we stand at the 2010 or 2011, go back, the investors, the, the planners, governments, they all get together, discuss it. How much will be electricity demand in, in 2015, let's say? What do you think will be the answer? Conservative will say, well, at that time, it's, a 10, it's a 12, to, 12 to 13. Conservative will say 10. More optimistic will say 14. But nobody was, will be able to forecast the electricity demand will go down to 1% mm -hmm. by 14, 15. Like, you just cannot. You stand high, forecast high, you stand low, forecast low. And at, the moment, at this moment, nobody will forecast the electricity demand will go, down to, go up to 7. You'll be crazy to do that, given that last year is only 1%. So, so it, that's the situation. It seemed to me that in a developing country, large one, with a huge no, large economic growth, it seems to me that surplus and shortage is unavoidable. 
It's because that you prepare for something, you come up end up with something else, and that's because of fluctuations. So, so what I what I'm saying here is that uh, yes, the gap is possible. Fluctuation is because of so much concentration and heavy industry respond to the economic environment very quickly, and also that uh, you know, uh, uh, the whatever China coming up right now is uh, is a kind of you know, you can do better, but it's not really avoidable. So the the the, but. I have an answer, three answer how to forecast China's future energy demand because I'm not pretending I can do it because I cannot. Given that you can see the you can you, you can see the, the 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 picture here, but in terms of any structure, the picture is much clearer. Okay, and in my questioning, how come you cannot for, forecast the demand? How can you forecast the, the structure? Why I do my best. This is the China's energy structure at this moment. Uh, in twenty, this is in I think in twenty. 40, 15, this one, I update one, one more year. And 2016 number is maxed up as, again. I couldn't really figure out how they come up with number for 2016. But let's use it 2015. Uh, the oil is 18%, coal is 64. The land fossil fuel is 12. Natural gas is 5.9. Right now it's 6 point something, OK? 6.2, 6.3. Nuclear is 1.4. Wind and solar put together is on 2.1. Hydro is 8.5. Now the what is going to happen for the energy structure under the 13 five years plan? We have very clear mandate for energy structure, actually. Now, let's look at the, the, the how it's going to happen. Well, the, if you look at the coal, coal 64% definitely have to, come, have to come down. There's no other, you cannot really negotiate with that because of the pollution, because of low carbon development. The hydro is going to be more or less a threat, 8.5%. Maybe in short run go to nine, later on go back to 8.5, because the limit potential. We don't have much potential anymore. So if the hydro can maintain its share in the short to medium term, we, we, we are lucky. So the, what is left is that the natural gas and also the wind and solar, nuclear, put together. We saw the cleaner one. So it seemed to me that the, the, the coal will go down, the oil will maintain more or less. And then the, the hydro will also maintain more or less the same, same mix, same proportion. But the clean one, clean one here means the natural gas, wind, solar, and nuclear all together roughly 10% in 2015, roughly 10% in 2015. This one go up, but coal will go down. So that's the, this one is clear. There's no, not much doubt on this one. However, it really depends on how much primary energy demand grows. Right now, the, the cleaner one, natural gas, nuclear, wind, and solar put together roughly 10%. Now, that's assuming primary energy increased by 1%. That 10% had to increase by 10% to meet the 1% incremental. So let's say that if energy, primary energy demand is a growth of 1%, the substitution of coal is still possible. But what if primary energy go up to 20%, mm -hmm. then you got a big problem. The coal is possibly need to come back. So the, really, the future energy structure changes. It really depends on how much energy demand growth, the primary energy demand growth. Though one close to zero, we substitute the coal. One, we should be able to meet the incremental demand using natural gas when and saw the nuclear. If you go to two or three, then you've got a problem compared to coal. So don't say that coal is at the peak at this point, because we still don't know that in the future how much energy demand coming back. We have no idea. Because given the history, there's a huge back and, back and forth. Why did the new, would the current new economic situation is a real, a new one, or is it just a slow down, temporary slowing down? We still don't know. We have to see uh, uh, for another couple of years. Now, given that the the, the condition of the, let's see the government's target uh, by 20, 2020. The government target is that we, we are going to have 15% of land force of fuel. Right now it's a little bit, a little bit more than 12%. So the most still missed of 2 or 3%. Given the current government's effort pushing for nuclear, for wind and solar, that's a possible. And also in the short run, we can also have some hydro increase. So that's a possible that by 20, 20, we are going to have 15 non-fossil fuel. Now the, 
the argument here, the, as I said, oil possibly increase a bit because of security issues. We are depending on abroad 65%. It's a huge country. We don't want to depend too much, even though that's inevitable. But at least we try to make it slowly. The, the dependency will make it slowly. So the oil will be somewhere around 18.5%. And then the here, hydro will be, the show run will go up to 9%. So nuclear 2.5, that 2.5, that one, that the cleaner one, fossil fuel up to 15%. So the main debate, in fact, by 2020 is between natural gas and coal. In the government's target, natural gas is a 10%. But I don't believe that's possible because I calculated it. Last year, natural gas is roughly 8%. Now, if I assume that 1% energy demand incremental every year, that will require from now on every year 15 to 16% real growth of natural gas every year. In that case, I don't think that's possible because given it's only 8% last year. I don't know from demand side, well, that's not that bad because we have a very little natural gas turbine. We can always use natural gas for, for, for peak, for peak power, a matter if more efficient, as long as the government willing to pay for it, to come up with a special tariff, natural gas term can come up very quickly. So the demand side is really not a problem. But however, the oil, all the people in China told me the demand side could be a problem. But in my view, the demand side, if government willing to do it, willing to push for 10%, they can actually do it. But what about supply side? Well, the, the people say, well, it's funny. We have a surplus at this moment. I say, yes. Now we only use for cooking and and what? Cooking and heating, a little bit heating. Of course, you have surplus. But what you begin to go, go, go into the, to the electricity generation, I still have surplus or not? You don't. So um, and you don't know where the gas will come from. In fact, uh, that is the bilateral, and they uh, need to build the infrastructure or something like that. So therefore, uh, I feel the natural gas is, uh, is a big question mark at this moment. I put it 8.5%. If 8.5% is manageable, we, we have 8, 9% growth every year. We can go to 8.5%. But if 8.5% cover will only go, to fit, go down to 58. Okay? But if the, somehow we can go to 10%, the go, could possibly go down to 56.5%, something like that. So, so what I'm saying is that the, 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 even though how, much, how hard we, you try, we try, the China system is the ecosystem, one way or the other. And for a long time, for a long, long time to come, it's the ecosystem. Because the next one is 18%, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a oil. And as long as you have 20 to 25%, you are, you are, you are the, your big brother. So the, 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 it seems to me to, to, to avoid the coal, discussion of the coal is very difficult in China. And by the way, we roughly had about 1,000 gigawatt, I believe, in a couple of years of coal-fired power plant lock. How are you going to get rid of coal? It is not possible. What you do is you slow down the coal, make sure that we, in the future, incremental, we use the greener one, we use the cleaner one to, to satisfy the demand, and at the same time to, to reduce the coal. How much do I stay at time? No, five Minus minutes. five. Huh? Minus five. Minus five, okay, thank you. <laughs> do I need to answer some questions? No, have you finished? Or, I mean, I you, do a, have no, a, you do have another five minutes. No, so uh, it's a minus, right? <laughs> that was him. He, he, he meant five to go. <laughs> that was him. Okay. Go, carry on, you've got another five minutes. Okay, give me two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Just okay. come, yeah. We'll, we'll negotiate for that. Uh, in fact, uh, the next one I'm going to comment, just simple comment on it, is that, uh, in fact, uh, looking forward, we really don't know how much energy might coming out. Okay, one way or the other. We just don't know. But I do see the opportunities. Uh, because China has a huge surplus at this moment. Every, almost every sector, cement, steel, electricity, coal, 25 to 30 percent of surplus. So what government doing right now is reduce overcapacity, try very hard. And what, of course, what they do is use an administrative measure to do it. It's simple, straightforward. But the problem is it creates a huge problems. Now I have a few questions on this reduction of overcapacity. One is that. How do we know China is really over capacity? Give me the lo more, a longer term perspective. And how much is over capacity? If China's capacity is the backward capacity, then yes, understandable. Take it out because it's inefficient, it's no good. But the problem is over the last 10, 10 or 20 years, take the electricity sector as an example. 
really not much backward capacity. China's electricity is best in the world. Why well, is the best? Because it's big, it's new, it's brand new. We installed roughly 600 gigawatt in, in the last 10 years or so. And that's all super critical, you know, everything. So, so there's really not much backward capacity left in China's system over capacity system at this moment. Now, if we use administrative measures to reduce it, and in future you need it, then there'll be a big waste. You create even more emission. In fact, you have to build again. But, uh, so so, so I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, the first, we need to understand how much is over capacity, given a longer term perspective. How much China infrastructure is still needed? In my view, there, to compare China, if China eventually become a high income country, to compare China is not compare Beijing with New York. Definitely not. It's compare a countryside. The toilet in the countryside compared with the toilet in the country in the Japan, US, and also Europe. In that sense, there's a huge infrastructure demand there. Okay, still need the cement and steel to build it. But the problem is that in the countryside, the country the return is very low, so no, nobody's going to do it at, at, this, at this moment. Depends on government. If government has money, that's okay. If you go to, government don't have money. So therefore, it's difficult. So therefore, the, the, I believe that that is a longer term perspective. But short term perspective, I truly believe that to have a real reduction of the capacity, over capacity, the company need to make profit. Because in China, most difficult, most difficult thing of reducing over capacity is workers. In other countries, it's with the five workers, but in China, you cannot do that. For example, that I'm in the, with the board of Petro China. We have 1.6 million employees. In the last three years, our balance sheet is really real bad, okay, horrible but we haven't fired any single workers. Mm -hmm. Usually, what you respond immediately is that we fire someone, right? Reduce the, 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 the labor force in the, in the time of the, uh, of, of, the, of the low prices and also that, you know, not, not much demand. But in China, you cannot do that. What I mean is that if due to overcapacity, you still have to find job for those workers. If company has the money, it's easier to do it. So what I'm saying is that reduce overcapacity need to have company make some money. So we need to find opportunity for companies. Are there opportunity or not? Yes, the countryside infrastructure is very long term. Road and bear initiative, that's also part of, we can increase our, our capacity demand, you know, because those countries have no infrastructure, not much infrastructure. And China has so much infrastructure capacity. Yeah, there's a complement, we don't have resources, they have the demand for the infrastructure. So, they, but road and bear initiative also takes time. In the short run, why is the opportunity? I believe that the subway, Transit is a huge opportunity for China. Because uh, look at Beijing, have those in Beijing, you see on there, no, no movement at all. In fact, uh, the, if you look at the, this is the, I compare Tokyo with the Beijing. Uh, Tokyo has a, has a vehicle of 8,000. 8,000, 8,000, okay, that's 8 million. And the Beijing only has five, Shanghai only has three. But look at Tokyo, it's, it's, it's moving. But look at China, there's no movement at all. So what China need to do, and you look at, look at the, 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 the transit, rail transit, the, the Tokyo is a 2,500, Beijing is only five, and Shanghai is a six. And, and China altogether is a little bit more than Tokyo. It's not right. So what I'm suggesting to the government, I say, look, let's build a massive transit system across, yeah, in Beijing. Why well, it reduce oil consumption, right? Reduce the air pollution. It, the up there, Beijing, the housing price is crazy. All the major cities are crazy. Down there must be very valuable. So there are a lot of capital wind to get in. And look at, yeah, so much, you know, you utilize the, 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 the overcapacity, you can reduce the pressure on the, on the, on the urban centers. So everything together is very, and you can also, you can actually really possibly reduce the pressure on the housing price in the center because the people can move a little bit further away. But the precondition, you have to build a massive system and force people to go down there. Eventually, look at like Tokyo, that every 20, 86% actually use the road, tra road transit. Not everybody just you know, sit on the, on, the, on the street. Thank you. <laughs> As I said, we'll take uh, questions and comments at the end uh, so you can sort of integrate the, um, your questions across all four presentations. 
Next, uh, Reinhard Haas' presentation. And while he's setting it up, I'll just remind everybody that uh, Reinhardt uh, is running the, uh, with his colleagues, running the regional conference in Europe in uh, Vienna in the first week of September. Thank you, Tony. Good afternoon. If we talk about energy futures, I think it's well recognized that electricity will play a major role in the future. More and more services are provided by electricity. Shares of end-use consumption in electricity increase. And one of our major ideas, especially also in Europe, is to put more electricity to play more electricity, can generate more electricity from renewables, especially from variable renewables. And I will now show, share with you some of our ideas on how to integrate even more large quantities of variable renewables. I will give short an introduction on the motivation, show how variable renewables impact prices in electricity markets, explain the core problem of capacity payments. I will focus on the role of flexibility in sector coupling and balancing groups for a future market design and conclusions will complete my presentation. For the motivation, we had the Paris agreements with respect to climate change. We have European targets for increasing the share of renewables. We had a clean energy winter package some months ago. We have the intention to go more into competition and to more democratic systems. And one, let's say, criticism with respect to the lobby of the variable renewables is that it is not possible to squeeze these variable renewables by violence into the system. We have to look for proper financial incentives. This picture shows electricity generation in EU28, and the success story for renewables was that they are no more an alternative energy, but they are, let's say, mainstream energy. At least since 2013, renewables generate the largest part of electricity in EU28 in Europe. The objective of my presentation is to identify the major boundary conditions to integrate even larger amounts of variable renewables. Very important in this context is that our reflections apply in principle to every electricity system worldwide. And it is now based on an electricity economic and not on a technical point of view. So what we say, what is old thinking is a system that is just dominated by the generators, and this was prevailing in the past. At the end, I will show the new way of thinking. An important condition is day ahead electricity markets have since the beginning of liberalization the expectation that prices should be equal to short term marginal costs. If I say day ahead, it also includes intraday. And the short term marginal costs are simply equal to the fuel costs. And due to huge depreciated excess capacities at the beginning of liberalization, this expectation was widely accepted. Now let's look what changes if we have variable renewables increasing their market share. Here we have typical merit order curve. In this case, let's say without photovoltaics, and we will obtain a market price. If we now increase the share of photovoltaics at this specific hour, we will have a shift of the merit order curve to the right, and we will have a much lower price of electricity with photovoltaics. Let's now look how the situation is over a week with large shares of variables. The violet curve shows demand. We have some points of time where renewable generation is higher than demand, other points of time where it is lower. And this leads to a so-called residual load. And I think this is a key term of the future. Residual load is the load, total load minus the non 
flexible generation. And for this example, we would have a situation like that. We would have areas with excess electricity and others with under coverage. Under coverage means we generate less than we need. If we now translate this residual load curve into prices, we will have the current following situation. We currently have, at least in Europe, rather low average electricity prices over a year, for example, about 3 cents per kilowatt hour. But we have times with scarcity prices, and we have times even with negative prices. So this situation would lead to the effect of a relatively high new price spread if we integrate more variables into the system. And this price spreads provides incentives also for new flexible solution for storage, for demand side management. If we now construct a classic, this classified residual load curve, not just over the week, but over a year, we have a curve like this, where we have, again, under coverage on the top and excess generation at the right on the bottom. Of highest interest now is this red circled area. The question is, how can we cover the load in this few hours of the year where the residual load is very high. And typically there are two extreme positions. We can do it by a regulated capacity market with short-term marginal cost pricing, or we can do it by competition between the supply side and the demand side technologies and behavior, storage, grid, and other flexibility options. But we need the correct scarcity pricing signals. And we are now convinced that given the price pattern I have shown before, which shows this excess and scarcity prices, it would be attractive for a sufficient number of flexible power plant operators to stay in the market. And this is a typically called revised energy only market. What is now the core problem of the capacity payments? In my point of view, there are two major points. The first one is that if we have capacity payments or strategic reserves, these destroy the energy-only market by providing misleading price signals, especially the prices at these scarce times are too low. Because the basic principle would be that price peaks at times of scarce resources should revive the markets and lead to the correct quantities from a competitive market's point of view. Let's now look again at this red circled area I have shown before. How can we meet this demand? One approach is to extend the transmission grid, and extension of the transmission grid flattens demand curve and flattens also the generation curve of the variable generators. Next is at these points of time, we will have rather high prices. In Germany, they discussed even 2,000 euro per megawatt hour. And of course, there will be some customers who will reduce the load to benefit from these high prices. Then we have opportunities of load reduction due to demand side management in a technical way, for example, by cycling. And now we have here flexible power plants, maybe natural gas power plants, in the correct magnitude needed, and afterwards there are storages and others. What is important is that we have now here a capacity without insured payments, and this comes just about by the market due to the correct pricing. In the long term, we also have other problems. If we look, for example, at the situation over a year, we have at some points of time here excess capacity, and in this case, long-term storage is needed. And this leads to the example of sector coupling. Sector coupling is considered with respect to heat and transport, and the example for transport in this case is that here we have the possibility of, let's say, direct sector coupling with respect to electric vehicles, 
We can have hydrogen storage and use the hydrogen storage finally here <coughs> in this fuel cell vehicle. But this is a long term option, and for the moment, I think we still have to accept that there are similar, several problems with respect to the sector couplings. So the idea is that in times of surplus generation, we use electricity for heating and cooling and on the other side for transport. But I would say today we have still some vague simplified suggestions and there are no convincing long-term solutions. In addition, we have to think about central, for example, different power to something approaches versus decentralized for example, on end user level, heat pumps, electric vehicles. There were many presentations here at this conference, which were looking at the details of this couplings. And back to my last slide, we have to think how to fit the use with time of surplus. For example, can we really use photovoltaic electricity for heating? This brings me to my Almost last point with respect to the types of electricity markets and how to organize them. Usually, electricity markets consist of three major elements, long-term, short-term, and very short-term markets. I will focus on the short-term, the year ahead and intraday markets, and try to explain the core role of balancing groups. A balancing group is an entity in a specific control area of an electricity system. And it exists in Germany, it exists in Austria, but you can consider it, for example, as a municipal utility of Vienna, of Singapore, of Shanghai. It's an entity where you have to balance at every moment demand and supply. That is to say, you may have different generators in the balancing zone. You have imports, you have exports, and you have consumers. But at the end, the balance must be evened out. And if this is not the case, then you have to pay. But to meet this target, the operator of the balancing zone or of the supply company of Singapore can have own generation, can have storage, can use flexibility measures, trading contracts in the long term, they had an intraday market. But if there are deviations, the costs are very high. So the balancing group manager should avoid these deviations. So this finally leads to a situation, what we call new thinking, where you have, let's say, different generators feeding electricity into the grid. You have still some storages as before, but you have now a two-way system where the balancing group, let's say, is a major coordinator. You have prosumers, you have different flexibility options, and you also have generation and storage at the side from the end user. And we think that in this system of the future, we can have more democracy, more flexibility, and an additional component is the possibility of decentralized photovoltaic systems. We had tremendous decreases in the costs of PV systems in the last 10 to 15 years, and for the example of Germany, here we have the development of household electricity prices. And in this figure, by about 2012, we would have reached grid parity, that is to say the household electricity price is equal to the costs. And this gap has widened, and today the difference between these two is even much larger. But what only counts is if the purchase of electricity, if the savings of electricity are smaller than the costs, the customers will use it and buy PV systems by themselves. But what is important is that this is a process that is irreversible. There is no sign, no reason why PV prices should increase again. 
So for the future, in many countries, more and more customers will have this opportunity to generate the electricity by themselves. Of course, own use is shown here on the vertical axis. Own use is not or almost never 100 percent. So you have to find the proper size of the system with respect to your current own consumption. This brings me to my major conclusions for this future electricity <coughs> outlook. First, I think most important is that a future sustainable electricity system needs the integration of many technologies and demand set options, and there will, no, there will not be any single solution, one size fits all. It is important to note that larger market areas are in principle favorable, as I have explained. Very important for the integration are correct price signals, which offers also possibilities for other new small players, and here in brackets, including CO2. This would help a lot and would lead to the, not the need for subsidies. Most urgent in this context is to exhaust the full creativity of all market participants, including what I have explained, decentralized photovoltaic systems. And the key is flexibility, including also dispatchability of variable renewable, for example, <coughs> wind power. You can shed wind power at some times and you can have a huge contribution to a better market performance. Currently, we have rather low economic incentives for these flexibility measures, but some activities we see in different balancing power markets have started, and I think they are very promising. With respect to capacity payment, we just have to bear in mind that any capacity payment will distort the systems towards more conventional and less renewable capacity because they are competing or kicking out of the market the flexibility measures. And in such a system, I think there's a new key player, which is a balancing group or a supply company, which makes contracts with different stakeholders, but no more the generators. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, uh, Ryan Hart, for covering a topic which is uh, plaguing many liberalised power markets at the moment. Um, our next speaker uh, is Peter Hartley, who is uh, past president of the IAEE. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, also uh, thank you all for staying through to the last session. Um, and I'm going to, uh, some of what I have to say is, uh, I think, going to summarise a lot of what I've seen in the, some of the other presentations through the conference, but maybe a slightly different take on it. Uh, but uh, Tony also asked me to say some controversial things, so I'm, I'm going to throw in something controversial at the end, right. so we'll see how we go with that. Um, so I've been thinking about uh, energy transitions uh, recently in some research, uh, thinking about a dynamic optimization model where you sort of go from where you are now to, to uh, where you may want to go in the long run. And uh, you know, a really important issue here, which I think Professor Lin emphasised, is that there's an enormous uh, amount of uh, inertia in the energy system. Uh, his, his sort of calculations really illustrated this, that uh, if you have a, a small source now, you have a, a growing demand, you have to, have, you have to really multiply the amount of that new source that you're adding to the system to keep its share the same. So it's just sort of the arithmetic of, of uh, growth. And uh, so this is a very important point, I think, to so that the systems tend to evolve uh, fairly slowly because of, because of this. Um, the other issue, the point that I want to make to start out with is that, uh, you know, I think that uh, fossil fuels, that sort of death of fossil fuels has probably been exaggerated, at least in the short and medium run, uh, not only because of this uh, issue, but also uh, because uh, there's a lot of technological change going on in the fossil fuel industry, and it's a moving, so it's a moving target uh, for the alternatives. And it's interesting, if you go to conferences in Houston, 
uh, almost all the discussion these days is about technology, new technology in the fossil fuel industry, and people bringing in technologies, uh, information technologies, and from lots of other industries. I went to a presentation not long ago where they talked about something they learned from the dog food uh, production industry. Uh, they managed to find a new uh, sensor that you put down hole and so forth that saves you lots and lots of money. So uh, there are all sorts of uh, um, new technologies in this incredible uh, atmosphere in the United States of uh, research into these uh, new technologies that have been producing fossil fuels. Uh, and so I just have one little simple diagram to kind of illustrate this point. So what I've, I've graphed here is uh, the blue is US production of oil and the red is the real uh, Brent oil price. I use Brent because we had restrictions on uh, pipelines in the United States for a while and the WTI price uh, deviated from, from the world price. But uh, it doesn't really matter for this purpose. But what you'll see here is, is that despite the huge uh, drop in the real oil price, US oil production uh, kept on growing. It, it did drop a little bit, but it's, it's sort of uh, also come back this year. And uh, some of that, of course, is the uh, drop in the cost because you've had less pressure on some of the inputs into the industry. But really, a huge part of it is continuing technological change, which has really made uh, this unconventional uh, oil and gas production. The same sort of story here is with gas. This one's gas price. It's a Henry, real Henry Hub price, and you've got uh, real gas production, in the, uh, gas production in the United States. So uh, despite the fall in the real price, uh, you're able to get uh, continued uh, growth in production, or very high production, because of all the technological change. Uh, so that's kind of my first message. Uh, it's sort of a message from Houston, I guess. <laughs> a little different from what we've, we've heard here. Uh, the, the other thing that I would like to talk a little bit about is, is uh, sort of the type of fossil fuel. And so, you know, I think for a long time people have been arguing that uh, we do expect uh, the, the sort of economy to move towards uh, uh, natural gas. And a uh, really important point about that, I think, is the growth uh, sort of de developments in the LNG market, which uh, are going to, I think, spread some of the benefits of some of these lower uh, costs of produ producing natural gas to other countries around the world, not just the United States. Uh, and so I'll say a little bit about this. So we've, uh, here's uh, world natural gas trade. And this is kind of pictures that we've seen, I think, during the conference. Other people put something up like this. Uh, total gas trade is the, the blue. Or the pink is the LNG part. And the green line measured against the right-hand scale is the LNG proportion. So over time, we've had a big growth in a trade in LNG, both pipeline, a big, big trade in gas, both pipeline and LNG. But the proportion of LNG has actually uh, grown relative to the total. Um, and uh, the, actually, the growth in uh, uh, LNG since 2000 is 6.1% annually, uh, despite a weak market in 2011 and 2016. Contrast that with the average annual growth of global total primary energy uh, from natural gas of around 2.5. So that's this, the LNG part's gone up faster than, than uh, uh, natural gas as a whole. Uh, and actually, gas has actually increased its, its share in uh, TPE as well. And some reasons for the growth of LNG have been the lower costs uh, of LNG shipping, and especially floating storage and regasification units, which have lowered the cost of regasification. Uh, and of course, I think the strategic value uh, of LNG relative to pipeline gas. Uh, and so there I'd advertise um, Natalie's paper. Uh, she won the prize for the best paper. So uh, she's talking about how um, those of you who went to her, her presentation, the, the value of LNG uh, as a strategic uh, um, a weapon, I suppose you'd say, in, in, uh, within Europe. Uh, natural gas has several advantages as a fuel, especially relative to coal, because it's less polluting. Combined cycle gas turbines in particular are more, much more energy efficient. And open cycle gas turbines or, uh, are very flexible and are useful for backing up renewables. So I think all these things uh, have led to uh, an increase in the demand for natural gas. But, you know, nevertheless, uh, natural gas is more expensive in most uh, locations around the world uh, than coal and requires more expensive infrastructure. So actually the average annual growth of total primary energy from coal worldwide over the same period has been 3.8%, which is higher than gas. Um, now another thing about uh, the gas markets, so I've got a graph here of uh, various spot prices. So this is uh, the um, national balance point price in the UK, the Henry Hub and the Jan J Japan Korea market price. And you'll see right on the left of the diagram that basically all three prices move together. That's when the United States was importing LNG into the Gulf Coast. Uh, but then uh, around uh, 2010, uh, the development of the shale gas essentially shut off LNG imports into the Gulf Coast where they compete 
with Henry Hub. Uh, and so you had a separation of the US price from the other two, but the other two still went together until we had Fukushima uh, and there was a huge increase in the demand for gas, uh, including particularly spot gas. And then you had a separation. It's basically like the equivalent of a basis blowout is the way uh, I describe that. And basis blowout in the US where you have you know, cold uh, vortex in uh, New England, cr huge demand for natural gas, not enough pipeline capacity to get there. You end up with $100 gas in Boston with $3 gas in, 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 in uh, Louisiana. So uh, similar kind of thing here. If you have a big increase in LNG, uh, you have like the equivalent of a basis blowout. Uh, you can see, though, after the particularly development of the PNG uh, LNG terminal and, and other terminals in the Pacific, uh, the critical shortage has gone away, and now, again, you've got basically JKM and NBP running together. Henry Hub is still below, but we would expect Henry Hub, once the US gets into exporting, uh, to start to track the others as well as an export net back. There will be a, a differential, but uh, it should really uh, be, uh, once again, related to the others, this time through exports rather than uh, imports. Um, the other thing that we've seen in the LNG market is a big increase in the proportion of spot and short-term trade. That's here, the blue line. Uh, it's now up towards uh, 30%. Uh, this is the GIIGNL uh, definition of short-term trade, uh, four, four years or less. The red line down the bottom is re-exports of LNG, uh, and that's also been growing. And, uh, and I would argue that the growth in the short-term trade is also helping with uh, arbitraging uh, natural gas prices around the world. And so uh, putting that together, what might be the effect of the U.S. plants on, uh, on LNG trade? Well, these U.S. plants uh, require much less investment because essentially there are a lot of brownfield uh, plants in effect. A lot of the port works have already been done. The storage facilities have already been built. Uh, and the pipeline connections to the market were already in place. This was all done because these were regas terminals originally when everyone thought the United States was going to become the biggest importer of LNG in the world. Uh, so these are a lot cheaper to build, which is very important. You don't need to find as much uh, long-term contract to finance the investment. Um, that's my view of uh, one of the major reasons for long-term contracts. Um, and these uh, ex exports from the US should support continued growth, really, of spot pro uh, trade and price arbitrage. The exports uh, are under a tolling arrangement with a feed gas price uh, related to Henry Hub, tied to Henry Hub. Uh, a lot of the buyers are adding LNG to their global portfolio, which they're using to optimise trade around the world and equilibrate, take advantage of uh, arbitrage opportunities. And the future, with these terminals being built, because of the accident of history, we're going to have these uh, export terminals right next to import terminals with a pipeline connection to the uh, deep, most uh, liquid um, gas market in the world. Uh, and to me, what's that spell? It's, it's, it, it just smells like arbitrage. <laughs> so these things are op ideally set up to take advantage of uh, arbitrage opportunities. Uh, nevertheless, I would argue that uh, the number of um, terminals that are going to be built and the amount of LNG to be exported to the United States probably is going to be limited really by economic factors. And eventually we are going to need, as someone has pointed out in some of the presentations I've heard here uh, at the conference, the future greenfield developments are likely to require higher prices and long-term contracts to underwrite the investment. I have a little uh, uh, chart here of the proposed uh, LNG terminals in the United States. The ones operational or under construction, you can see there, amount to more than a quarter of the 2016 uh, total LNG market in the world. Uh, if you add in the ones that are approved and not yet, uh, not yet under construction, it takes you up to almost a half of the 2016 uh, total LNG trade worldwide. And you add on uh, six terminals pending application and seven in pre-filing, uh, it adds up to more than 110% of the 2016 LNG market. So it ain't going to happen. <laughs> okay. So, but uh, a lot of this is under construction. It will be built, and it's going to have an impact on the world market. And I think it's going to uh, lead to much more price arbitrage uh, between regions. Uh, and here, as I sort of emphasise that point again, here's uh, typical shipping costs actually. And uh, this is done, taken from Platts. But uh, what you find is, is that uh, uh, you know, the US is not exactly, uh, shipping costs are pretty high to lots of parts of the world. And so, um, you know, th there's a, an issue. Uh, it, it won't actually bring prices down to US prices, but uh, still I expect them to be related and to track uh, with a gap, and it will be a substantial gap. Um, the next point I want to make is that, uh, so this is uh, sort of oil, I think we've got, uh, you know, the technological development I talked about, we've got into gas. 
Uh, the third thing is, uh, and this came up very much in a session I was at here where people were talking about the need to uh, expand electricity consumption uh, around the world. And the key point is that developing countries want cheap electricity. Okay? And they want to have what the rest of us, have. people living in those countries, want to have what the rest of us have got. And electricity is incredibly important to your standard of living. And I would say these people have every right to, have, to be able to get the same kind of standard of living we've got. It's very important for education, it's very important for health care, very important for lots of things uh, to your standard of living. And so in order to uh, provide electricity, people want to use the cheapest form uh, of electricity there is. And so this, I think, gets back to the coal point. So uh, this is growth in uh, world coal consumption, and the big green in there is China. But we've also got India coming along, the purple, and then, you know, we have things like right in this region, Indonesia has a program to add 35 gigawatts of generating capacity. Last I saw, the plan was 30 of the 35 are going to be coal. Um, so, uh, you know, and this is a map that we like to show at the Centre of uh, Energy Studies at Rice University. Uh, this is a um, map of the night time uh, where the lights are on. Where the lights are on in the world is where the electricity is. And a lot of those places where there's darkness, it's not because uh, there's no people there. There's billions of people there, but they don't have any lights. And they want to get the lights, just like the rest of us. And, uh, and a lot of, for a lot of people, that means they're going to be using coal. And I just think that's, that's a fact. For the next few decades, you want to think about energy, uh, what's going to happen with uh, the energy system. So we've got the, the inertia, we've got the, this, uh, this development. Um, uh, economic development of these countries means um, that uh, there's going to be an increased demand for coal. <coughs> By the way, if you look at India there, there's lots of lights on, but we were told in one of the sessions here that there's still 250 million people in India who don't have access to reliable uh, grid electricity. Uh, and of course, uh, these points are reflected in any kind of energy forecast you'd like to pick up. I just picked the EIA one. And, uh, and what you see is, you know, still tremendous growth of fossil fuels for, uh, you know, the, ne the immediate next few decades. And I just think that's, realistically, that's, that's what we're going to see. But what about in the long run? And we want to think about a, a dynamic optimization. You've got to work backwards. The fundamental principle of dynamic programming is what's the optimal investment now? It depends on what your ultimate target is, and then you've got to work backwards, right? So the qu we know in the long run we're going to have to replace fossil fuels. So, uh, so I got to thinking about the system, you know, and thinking about these kinds of issues. What would the long-run system look like, and what implications might that have for investment in the short run? Well, shorter run, you know, beyond these few decades where we're going to rely a lot more on fossil fuel. And so, uh, I got to thinking about, uh, about this issue, and um, I was looking at. So, I decided to look at the Texas system, where we have a huge amount of wind, uh, and take that as a model of what it would mean to supply electricity uh, without fossil fuels. Um, actually, I've got, I've got, I'm going to sneak a little bit of gas in here uh, as backup power, but uh, basically without fossil fuels. And the idea is, you know, in the long run, we think that uh, basically the system is going to be dominated by electricity as the energy, so energy supply source. I mean, we can put transport onto electricity. Electricity can provide heating services, and electricity, of course, can provide electricity. So, Essentially, about the only thing I can think of where we have a problem is probably aeroplanes. Uh, so uh, I think the long-run issue becomes, you know, how do you generate electricity? And uh, so uh, the point here is the two obvious candidates, I think, for uh, something other than fossil fuels in the long run, at the moment at least, looking at current technologies, are wind and nuclear. Uh, and of course, both of them would actually require storage. And so I looked at uh, storage technologies, and of course, at the moment, about 99% of the world's grid level storage is pump storage. Uh, the EIA uh, department, or it might have been the Department of Energy actually, the Department of Energy recently did a study on batteries, a big study on batteries. I looked at that and uh, uh, what you find is uh, the levelised cost of battery systems is still 50% you know, higher than uh, pump storage. So I'm going to say, okay, let's take the cost of pump storage as the target. Let's suppose we're going to get uh, the cost of uh, batteries and so on down to the cost of pump storage. So in the long run, we're going to have uh, you know, either wind and storage or nuclear and storage. And then uh, what, 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 what might we do in terms of a transition toward that, uh, starting with fossil fuels? And the fossil fuel I'm going to assume here is gas. So thinking, again, maybe a US-centric uh, view, but you know, no one's building new coal-fired power, but you know, everyone's building gas still. So we're going to go from, from gas into something else eventually. Um, now, the problem, if you think about this, uh, wind, wind uh, currently is the most competitive renewable energy source, 
Um, it has uh, rapid growth, uh, has actually helped further reduce costs of the wind. But, um, you know, it has various problems.